Assalamu alaikum, Louisville. Here to skip a kip a key. You don't fuck with me. Some years ago, I was able to speak at Warren in this state. It happened to be at the time that President McKinley was assassinated. In common with all others, I deplore that tragic event. There's not a socialist who would have been guilty of that crime. We do not attack individuals. We do not seek to avenge ourselves upon those opposed to our faith. We have no fight with the individuals as such. We are capable of pitying those who hate us. We do not hate them. We know better. We would freely give them a cup of water if they needed it. There's no room in our hearts for hate, except for the system, the social system in which it is possible for one man to amass a stupendous amount of fortune while doing nothing, while millions of others suffer and struggle and agonize and die for the bare necessities of existence, having a hand-to-mouth type of life. President McKinley, as I have said, had been assassinated. I was the first to speak at Portsmouth. Having been booked there some time before the assassination, promptly the Christian ministers of Portsmouth met in special session and passed a resolution declaring that Debs, more than any other person, was responsible for the assassination of our beloved president. <laughs> okay, so Portsmouth blamed Eugene Debs for killing President William McKinley. Debs. It's like when the Gripshevers blamed Tony Aloysius Gripshever for killing his own mother. It's not true. It did not happen. They, they are not responsible for their death. Uh, President McKinley was, um, was either Charles Guteau. Well, let's find out. President McKinley. There's only been there's been four assassinations in American history. Abraham Lincoln, JFK, James Garfield, and William McKinley. William McKinley was the 25th president. He led the nation to victory in the Spanish-American War when America became an empire. So McKinley was the beginning of the empire. September 1901, so he was assassinated one year after William Justice Goble, the governor of Kentucky, was assassinated. And his assassination was by Leon Zolgaz. Zolgaz. Leon Zolgaz. With a C. Z C Z O L G O S Z. So Leon Zolgaz, who they claim is an anarchist, tried to or hoped to assassinate him, managed to get close to the presidential podium, but did not fire certain of hitting uncertain of hitting his target. Zol goes, since hearing a speech by fellow anarchist Emma Goldman in Cleveland, they decided to do something heroic in his own mind for the cause. He initially decided to get to near, initially decided to get near McKinley, and on September 4th decided to assassinate him after the failure on the 5th. Zol goes, waited the next day at the Temple of Music on the exposition grounds where the president was to meet the public after his return from Niagara Falls, the anarchist concealed his gun in a handkerchief and when reached the head of the line, shot McKinley twice in the abdomen. So, the anarchist shot McKinley twice in the stomach and that's what ended up killing him. So, so McKinley, President William McKinley was killed by Leon Cole Zolgos. Zolgos. Leon Zolgos, the anarchist, Leon the anarchist, it seems easier than Zol, learning Zolgos, so it is more, uh, if you want to do philosophy, Emma Goldman was more uh, responsible for McKinley's death than um, Eugene Debs, anarchist thought versus socialist thought, so Eugene Debs versus Rand Paul, you know, someone like Rand Paul, an anarchist like Rand Paul, or, uh, you know, the other libertarians. Um, so they're blaming it on Eugene Debs. It's due to the doctrine that Debs was preaching that this crime was committed, according to these patriotic parsons, and so this pious gentry, the followers of the meek and lowly Nazarene concluded that I must not be permitted to enter the city, and they had the mayor issue an order to that effect. 
I went there soon after, however, I was to speak at Warren, where President McKinley's double cousin was postmaster. I went there and registered. I was soon afterward invited to leave the hotel. I was exceedingly undesirable that day. I was served with notice that the hall would not be opened and that I would not be permitted to speak. I sent back word to the mayor by the only socialist left in town and the only remain because they did not know he was there. I sent word to the mayor that I would speak and warn that night according to a schedule. I would leave here in a box for a return trip. The Grand Army of the Republic called a special meeting, then marched to the hall in four uniform and occupied the front seats in order to silence me if my speech did not suit them. So, alright. And I went to the hall, however, found it open, and I made my speech. There was no interruption. I told the audience, frankly, who was responsible for the president's assassination. I said, as long as there is misery caused by the robbery at the bottom, there will be assassination at the top. I showed them evidently to their satisfaction that it was their own capitalist system that was responsible. The system that had impoverished and brutalized the ancestors of the poor witless boy who had murdered the president. The poor witless boy, Leon Cosgo, Leon the Anarchist. Yet I made my speech at night and it was well received, but when I left there I was still an undesirable citizen. Some years later I returned to Warren. It seemed that the whole population was out for the occasion. I was received with open arms. I was no longer a demagogue, no longer a fanatic or an undesirable citizen. I became exceedingly respectable simply because the socialist has increased in numbers and socialism has grown in influence and power. If ever I become entirely respectable, I shall be quite sure that I've outlived myself. It is the minorities who have made the history of the world. It is the few who have had the courage to take their places at the front who have been true enough to themselves to speak the truth that was in them and who have dared oppose the established order of things, who have espoused the cause of the suffering, and struggling poor, who have upheld without regard to personal consequences the cause of freedom and righteousness. It is they, the heroic, self-sacrificing few, who have made the history of the race and who have paved the way from barbarism to civilization. The many prefer to remain upon the popular side. They lack the courage and vision to join the despised minority that stands for a principle. They have not the moral fiber that withstands, endures, and finally conquers. They are to be pitied and not treated with contempt, for they cannot help their cowardice. But thank God in every age and every nation there have been the brave and the self-reliant few. And they have been sufficient to their historic task, and we who are here today are under infinite obligations to them because they suffered, they sacrificed, they went to jail, they had their bones broken upon the wheel. They are burned at the stake and their ashes scattered to the winds by the hands of hate and revenge in their struggle to leave the world better for us than they found it for themselves. We are under eternal obligations to them because of what they did and what they suffered for us. And the only way we can discharge that obligation is by doing the best we can for those who are to come after us. And this is the high purpose of every socialist on earth. Everywhere they are animated by the same lofty principles. Everywhere they have the same noble ideals. Everywhere they are clasping hands across national boundaries, everywhere they are calling under one comrade the blessed word that springs from the heart of unity and bursts into blossom upon the lips. Each passing day they are getting into closer touch all along the battle line, waging the holy war of the working class of the world against the ruling and exploiting classes of the world. They make many mistakes and they profit by them all. They encounter numerous defeats and grow stronger through them all. They never take a backward step. The heart of the international socialist never beats a retreat. They are pressing forward here, there, and everywhere in all the zones that girdle the globe. Everywhere they, these awakening workers, these class-conscious proletarians, these hardy sons and daughters of honest toil proclaiming the glad tidings of the coming emancipation. Everywhere their hearts are attuned to the most sacred cause that ever challenged men and women into action in all the history of the world. Everywhere they're moving toward democracy and the dawn, marching toward the sunrise, their faces all glow with the light of the coming day. These are the socialists, the most zealous and enthusiastic crusaders the world has ever known. They're making history that will light up the horizon of coming generations for their mission is the emancipation of the human race. They have been reviled, they have been ridiculed, persecuted, imprisoned, and have suffered death. But they have been sufficient to themselves in their cause and their final triumph. It's but a question of time. Do you wish to hasten the day of victory? Join the Socialist Party. Do not wait for the morrow. Join now and roll your name without fear and take your place where you belong. You cannot do your duty by proxy. You have got to do it yourself and do it squarely. And then as you look yourself in the face, you have no occasion to blush. You will know what it is to be a real man or woman. You will lose nothing and you will gain everything. You will lose nothing and you will find something of infinite value. And that something will be yourself. And that is your supreme need to find yourself, to really know yourself and your purpose in life. 
You need at this time especially to know that you are fit for something better than slavery and cannon fodder. You need to know that you were not created to work and produce and impoverish yourself. To enrich an idle exploiter, you need to know that you have a mind to improve, a soul to develop, and a manhood to sustain. You need to know that it is your duty to rise above the animal planet of existence. You need to know that it is for you to know something about literature and science and art. You need to know that you are verging on the edge of a great new world. You need to get in touch with your comrades and fellow workers and to become conscious of your interests, your powers, and your possibilities as a class. You need to know that you belong to the great majority of mankind. You need to know that as long as you are ignorant, you are, as long as you are indifferent, as long as you are apathetic, unorganized, and content, you will remain exactly where you are. You will be exploited, you will be degraded, and you will have to beg for a job. You will get just enough for your slavish toil to keep you in working order, and you will be looked down upon with scorn and contempt by the very parasites that live and luxuriate out of your sweat and unpaid labor. If you would be respected, you've got to begin by respecting yourself. Stand up squarely and look yourself in the face and see a man. Do not allow yourself to fall into the predicament of the poor fellow who, after heard, after hearing a socialist speech, concluded that he too ought to be a socialist. The answer, the argument that he heard was unanswerable. Yes, he said to himself, all the speaker said was true, and I certainly ought to join the party. But after a while, he allowed his ardor to cool, and he soberly concluded that by joining the party, he might anger his boss, and then he might lose his job. Then he concluded, I can't take the chance. And that night, he slept alone. There is something in his conscience, and it resulted in a dreadful dream. Men always have such dreams. When they betray themselves, a socialist is free to go to bed with a clear conscience. He goes to sleep with his manhood, and he awakens, and he walks forth in the morning with his self-respect. He's afraid, and he can look the whole world in the face without a tremor and without a blush. But this poor weakling who lacked the courage to do the bidding of his reason and conscience was haunted by a startling dream. And at midnight, he awoke in terror, bounded from his head, and exclaimed, My God, there is nobody in this room. He was absolutely right. There is nobody in that room. How would you like to sleep in a room that had nobody in it? It's an awful thing to be nobody. It is certainly a state of mind to get out of the sooner the better. There is a great deal of hope for Baker, Ruthenberg, and Wagonetch. Wagonetch. W-A-G-E-N-K-N-E-C-H-T. Who are in jail for their convictions, but for the fellow that is nobody. There is no pardoning power. He is in for life. Anybody can be nobody, but it takes a man to be somebody. To turn your back to the corrupt Republican Party and the still more corrupt Democratic Party. The gold dust lackeys of the rolling class counts for still more after you have stepped out of those popular and corrupt capitalist parties to join the minority party that has an ideal that stands for a principle and fights for a cause. This will be the most important change you have ever made and the time will come when you will thank me for having made this suggestion. It was the days of days for me. I remember it well. It was like passing from midnight darkness to the noon tide light of day it came almost like a flash and found me ready it must have been in such a flash that great seething throb in russia prepared by centuries of slavery and tears and martyrdom was transformed from a dark continent to a land of living light egypt the egyptian revolution would be like the Ru russian revolution during world war one there's something splendid something sustaining and inspiring in the prompting of the heart to be true to yourself and to know to the best you know especially in a crucial hour of your life you're in a crucible Today, my socialist comrades, you're going to be tried by fire to know to what extent no one knows. If you're a weak fibered and faint hearted and you have will be lost to the socialist movement, you will have to bid you goodbye. You will not the stuff of what revolutions are made. We're sorry for you unless you chance to be an intellectual. The intellectuals, many of them are already gone, no loss on your side, nor gain on the other. I was always amused in the, the discussion of the intellectual phase of this question. It's the same standard under which the rank and file are judged. What would become of the sheep if they had no shepherd to lead them out of the wilderness into the land of milk and honey? Ah, yes, I'm your shepherd and ye are my mutton. They would have us believe that if we had no intellectuals, we would have no movement. They would have our party, the rank and file, controlled by the intellectual bosses as the Republican and Democratic parties are controlled. These capitalist parties are managed by intellectual leaders and the rank and file are sheep. The fall of the bellwether to the shambles. The Republican and Democratic parties of the common herd are not expected to think that is only that is not only unnecessary, but might lead you astray. That is what the intellectual leaders are for. They do the thinking and you do the voting. They ride in carriages at the front where the band plays and you tramp in the mud, bringing up the rear with great enthusiasm. The fucking intellectuals. 
Fucking intellectuals fucked up the 1848 revolutions and they're fucking up Occupy. Fuck you, intellectuals. Solidarity. Occupy Louisville. Viva la revolution.